everyone talks about lit reviews and how you should just write one up, but no one really talks about what is a literature review and what components does a good literature review have. That's what I'm going to tackle in this short video today. First, let's talk about the writing process. I truly thought in grad school that writing was a linear process. You get a topic, research, write the paper. But when working on my th thesis, I felt like I was circling the wagons. I kept having to retrace my steps and pull more research or consider something from a different angle or reorganize the paper. So then after grad school, when I was told that I would have to present to graduate students about writing, I said, no way. But then I found this graphic that completely explained the cyclical nature of writing, that sometimes you find a hole in your paper and have to go back and pull more research, or sometimes you find that you don't like the original way you organize the paper and need to rework it. In fact, in my case, I was told three days before I was to defend that it was a good paper, but that I didn't prove what I said I would. So I could either rewrite the paper or change what I said I was going to prove. I went with option B and it was smooth sailings from there. So what are we going to cover today? Well first, what is a lit review? Then we'll look at the structure of it, the difference between summarizing and synthesizing, four basic steps to creating a lit review, and then the organizational methods and tools to get you producing one yourself. So what is a lit review? It's a paper that reviews all the relevant literature on a particular subtopic. You have to survey, organize, and evaluate the sources in relation to one another. It is not your personal argument. It should lead to a hole or gap in the research, which would eventually become part of your research question. So what's the point? Well, Fink states that there are four possible purposes. To describe current knowledge, to support the need for new research, to explain previous research findings, and or to describe the quality of a body of research. Maybe something has been researched but not researched well. Once, when working with a student on a paper about the reading preferences of boys, she found an article that claimed it had found the reading preferences of teenage boys, but it only looked at a handful of boys in a white suburban school. It lacked the depth and breadth to be the end-all study, and that is why she wanted to keep researching the topic. A research paper usually begins by giving a broad view of the topic, narrows to the paper's specific area of the topic, then broadens to conclude with more universal implications or applications. You can see how the lit review is only one part of the larger research paper and should be broader at the beginning and then narrow in to talk about the specific research question to be looked at, which in this diagram shows up as the oval gap or hole. A lit review relies somewhat on some summary to show that you understand the field, but mainly on synthesis. One good text to grab about synthesis is They Say, I Say, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing. It shows various samples of synthesizing, including using quotations smoothly and even how to distance yourself from a source. Synthesis means that you connect the dots between your sources and don't just work from source to source or author to author but point to point. And remember, just because this is a lit review doesn't mean you can skip the normal parts of a paper. You should introduce your literature review and it should have a thesis statement, such as recent research on X shows that A, B, and C have had effects on whether blah, blah, blah. The body of the literature review is either organized thematically, which is most common, chronologically, so older research to newer research to show a change over time, or methodologically, which shows how different research methods were used on the subject. Remember, this is not organized by author, or else it would just be a trumped-up annotated bibliography. And of course, you should have a conclusion paragraph that tells us what the next steps are. What's the gap? So how do you get started? Look at examples you like and make sure that your topic isn't too broad. A quick search in the databases should help you determine that. And remember, you can always meet with a reference librarian for assistance with this part.
Another thing to consider is where you want to situate yourself. For example, if you want to look at how term limits affect diversity in the legislature, would you want to look at term limit literature, diversity in the legislature, or both? So the four steps are to generate that topic, collect your sources, evaluate those sources, and then make those connections. Generating a topic could be easy, such as a major debate in your field, or it could be a gap that you've seen in the research yourself. Just be careful that it isn't such a large gap that there isn't anything to guide you in writing the literature review. The next step is to start pulling your sources and I highly recommend that you pull them electronically. Save them to a USB drive and then review them at least 24 hours later. Sometimes the research that seems so salient the night before doesn't look so relevant in the daylight. The third step is to make sure that you have the best quality sources. Are they current? within the last 10 years unless writing a historical review? Are they academic quality, peer reviewed? And do you have some of the influential or seminal sources? Finally, you have to do your part. Take the sources, read them, understand them, summarize them, and then connect them with other sources so that you can present an organized literature review. This last step is the most crucial, but also the most difficult. Some tips include building a library of sources, either electronically through RefWorks, EndNote, Mendeley, Excel, or just via paper. Also, while taking notes, make sure to keep your source notes separate from your own thoughts and ideas. At one point in my reading and researching for my thesis, I had a brilliant idea, and then I remembered that it might have come from a source I read a month or so back. And once I looked back at my notes, I found the idea. So how do you make these connections? I found it difficult to see the connections when there were just margin annotations on the journal articles. So for me, the easiest way to see the most salient thoughts and then connect them with others was to make note cards. Each note card had a quote or paraphrased idea from a source and included an abbreviated citation like author last name, year, and page number. Then once you have this enormous pile of note cards, you can start to sort them into thematic piles. This system also works nicely because you might have some great thoughts you liked but find that they actually don't fit in with any theme. This might be part of the intro or conclusion or they might go in your trash pile. You can save these for another paper but it's important to weed out what doesn't belong in this paper. You can see in this picture that they have piles um, have then been paper clipped together given a header or title on a sticky note and then arranged into an outline format. Nice right? There might be some better online tools but Sometimes the kinesthetic nature of this system works really well for students. Another trick would be to fill out a lit review research matrix. Once you know what you're researching, then you can probably define a few things that would need to be defined before people can accept your research question. Then you can list the sources you have that work towards those definitions. In this example, we are researching graduate student writing issues, and you can see that we did not have enough sources that backed us up on the fact that graduate students do have lower order writing concerns, like grammar, punctuation, and citations. So we either needed to find more sources or drop that part of our research. We found more, by the way. Another colleague did something similar to this, but she built it all in Excel and then was able to sort the columns and see which sources addressed which issues. Finally, I want you to realize that there is a timeline for writing such a large in-depth paper. One thing to note about this timeline is that there is a major difference between writing, revising, and editing. We sometimes conflate the tasks, but it's really important to write quickly and revise and edit slowly. You will get less stuck if you do this and know that you have time to edit and revise later. Revising is big picture stuff like organization, transitions, etc. Editing is all the minor stuff, punctuation, spelling and citations. You should make two separate passes through your paper looking for these items and turn off that internal editor while writing. This will ensure a smooth writing process. 
And if you're a procrastinator like me, then using the backdating method might work well for you. First, you set a date by which you need to be editing or polishing a final draft, then revising, then actually writing, and so on, until you get to the present time where you need to choose a topic. Then take these dates and put them into your calendar so that you can be held accountable for them. Finally, notice the different types of energy that it takes to write a paper. Research writing has you shifting from right brain creative work to left brain critical work throughout the process. And don't forget to be patient when letting the paper sit for a while. You need distance from your paper in order to see it from the reader's perspective. If you have any questions on any of this or want to follow up, please feel free to email me or come by the CSL's Writing Lab. Best wishes!